Amen. All right, you can be seated. So if you were to look through the Gospels, you're going to quickly discover that Jesus has some really challenging things to say about money and possessions. And uh, he, he certainly, on that subject, was no hypocrite, though. Jesus often challenged people regarding their possessions, but what we find regarding Jesus and his life is that he had very little possessions. In fact, one passage that, that kind of paints that picture for us clearly is in Matthew chapter 18, verse 19 and 20. It says, the scribes came to him, A scribe came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So, a, a fox knows where it's going to sleep at night. A bird knows where it's going to sleep at night, right? They've prepared a place and they go there every time. But Jesus didn't have that. He never had a consistent place where he was staying, especially through his ministry. And when you stop and think about it, Jesus wasn't even born in his own home, right? I mean, he was constantly just going wherever the Lord provided for him. He was depending on the Father's provision. Can you imagine living that way? for a prolonged period of time. Just letting God show you where the next step is. It's also interesting to see that Jesus sent His disciples out kind of with the same mentality. When He sent them out to minister two by two in Luke chapter 9, it it says in verse 1 that He called the twelve together and He gave them power and authority over all demons and to heal diseases. And He sent them out proclaiming the kingdom of God and performing healing. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staff, nor a bag, nor bread, nor money. Do not even take two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that city. Boy, I'm telling you what, if I was pre- preparing to go out on a journey like that, this would not be my list. It would be the opposite of that list. Right? I'd be like, okay, Jesus, I got two sets of shoes. One's hanging off my backpack. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'd be covering all the bases. I like to be prepared. But what's interesting is if you look later in the book of Luke, in Luke chapter 22, verse 35, Jesus reminds them of that and he asks them a question. He's asking them to recall how did it go when you went out like that? So listen, Luke. 22 verse 35 Jesus said to them when I sent you out without money belt and bag and sandals you did not lack anything did you and they said no nothing that's pretty cool to be fair like Jesus doesn't ask everyone to do this thankfully (laughs) right um It was a specific request. He was asking the disciples at that time to do it that way. But he certainly is challenging. It's challenging for us to consider something that feels so crazy like that, to to not really have anything, especially coming from the world we live in now where we have an obsession with material things, right? Madonna's not the only one living in a material world. We're all in it, right? So, Materialism is a focus on and a trust in what we can touch and possess. That's what materialism comes down to. And some people might battle that a little bit more obvious, and and we might see that struggle, and some might be a little bit more subtle, and we might not see what's really going on inside of them. But one thing is for certain, we all struggle with this to some level or another. And we need to recognize that materialism is not just an issue of having stuff, right? Some people might go, well, I don't really have anything, so I don't know how I can be materialistic. Well, we can also struggle with materialistic and own very little if we're obsessed with other people's stuff, right? If we're constantly complaining about how little we have, we can also be very materialistic. So that form of materialism is called coveting. Right? And, and we can be just as guilty of that. Maybe we can be guilty of both at the same time. 
Whether you have a lot or a little, materialism can creep into our soul. And that's really the problem. It's not about what stuff we have or don't have and what's around us, but it's about the stuff that's going on inside of us that's the real concern. And it can quickly derail us as Christians and keep us from being who God has called us to be and made us to be. So it doesn't really matter what that thing is. If we feel safe because we have it, potentially moving into idle zone. And that could be because we have extra food in the pantry, because we have that extra tank of gas in the garage, or that 401k, or that spare car, or whatever it is, right? If we start to put our trust in that thing, then we're headed for trouble because we're embracing a form of idol worship. So Jesus plainly says that we cannot serve God and money, right? I mean, Jesus laid it out there. No matter how you come at it, no matter how you try to do both, you're not going to be able to do it. Jesus says you're going to love one and you're going to hate the other. You're going to serve one and you're going to despise the other. So let me ask you a question. If Jesus was to ask you to let go of every earthly possession, would that be for your good or just to test you? Is he just toying with you? At the end of the day, this is the question that gets asked of the rich young ruler. Maybe we could ask it a little bit differently. Do you think it's more valuable to pursue eternal treasure or earthly treasure? I think when we ask it that way, we're like, well, eternal, right? Of course, eternal treasure is better than earthly treasure. But it's hard for us to let go of that earthly treasure. So we're going to look at the rich young ruler. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 is what we're looking at. We're going to start at verse 17. And... Uh, and we're going to see that we're not the only one with this materialism problem and, uh, and how we need to be able to shift our focus from what we put our trust in to what's physical to what's spiritual, right? So there's not necessarily a ton of context here. We can just dive right in, and that's what we're going to do. Mark chapter 10, verse 17, and it says, He, Jesus, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I want you to notice something right away. There's an urgency from this guy. It doesn't say he waited in line. He ran up. I'm picturing this guy barges into the midst of whatever else is going on, and he crashes in it at, on his knees at the feet of Jesus. And, and he's, he's admittedly, like, you're on your knees, you're showing respect, but you're also taking the path. Like, he's kind of saying, hey, what I have to say is most important here. And he's preventing him from going anywhere. So he has this burning question on his mind. He wants to know how to be a part of the kingdom that Jesus has been proclaiming. And specifically, how can I have eternal life? Jesus responds with a question of his own. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. See, the rich man has no idea that Jesus has totally set him up, right? Because Jesus is really good at doing that. And he's declared that this man is a sinner, right? Because every man is a sinner. And that should be abundantly clear to everyone there in that place. No one can say, I'm, I'm good. And the only way Jesus can be declared good is if he's also God. So is this guy saying, hey, you're God, good teacher? But regardless, this man clearly can't be good. So Jesus begins to question like his goodness. In verse 19, he says, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to Jesus, Teacher, I have kept all these things since my youth. Boy, you can't get a bigger pat on the back for yourself than that. Like, you'll break an arm doing that one, right? He is really pumping himself up. 
And, and when he says since my youth, he's, he's probably saying since about the age of 12. Age of 12 is when the Jewish age of accountability kind of kicked in. And maybe this man had kept these commandments that Jesus had listed since he was 12. Seems unlikely, right? That he didn't at any point lip off to his mom or dad or, you know, something. But maybe. The thing is, Jesus has only listed a few sins. And he specifically listed the sins that we commit against each other. Okay? So this is not the full Ten Commandments. Absent from the list are the sins that we sin against God. Right? Well, all sin is against God, but there's the first four are specifically related to us connecting to God. And one of those is idolatry. Right? Also absent from this list is the sin, that it's an inward sin, the sin of coveting, right? Because you can covet and no one has to know it. Because you don't, ha- I mean, you don't have to say it. You can still be thinking it, feeling it, nurturing it, without ever expressing it out loud. So, so coveting is another one that, uh, you know, it's longing for something that someone else has. Uh, and so it goes right into that materialism thing as well. And, and this man clearly has a rather high opinion of himself. But Jesus is about to challenge the sin that he is protecting. The sin he's not admitting. And I wonder, do you ever find yourself protecting or defending certain sins in your life? See, if we're really going to fully follow Jesus... We have to be able to let go of those obstacles. Those ones that we don't want to think about. Because you know if you start to even stop and think about that area of your life, you're going to go, I know. Right? I know. And we feel convicted. And we also know that we really won't be free until we take it head on. And confess it. And begin to take steps to change. But I want you to notice Jesus' motivation for what he's about to say to this rich young ruler. Because Jesus isn't trying to toy with him. He's not trying to torture him. He's not even really trying to trap him. As you read this text, you'll see Jesus is filled with this huge compassion and love for this man. That's his motivation. Jesus sees his slavery to his possessions, even though this man might not be able to see it that clearly. Verse 21, look what it says. It says, looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. So I don't think Jesus was over here being sarcastic or snide or coy or any of that stuff. He, He was compassionate and full of love for this guy. Full of love for him, he says, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. So it's interesting to do a little research on this particular point, because to me this sounds pretty outlandish. But as I did a little research, it was shocking to me to discover that this was something that did happen often for rabbis with someone who wanted to be one of their pupils, is that they would make some kind of request of them. And and often it was to generously help someone or something or to give in some way. The the Jewish culture was very generous to the needy. And so it would not have been crazy for Jesus to have said, hey, I want you to make this large donation or this large contribution to that thing, and then I'll take you on as one of my disciples, right? Right? And, and some other teachers actually did do this as kind of a test. If you had a particularly rich student and you felt like he was not going to take this whole uh, studi- st- studying thing seriously, if he was not going to be a good pupil, then, then he, the, the teacher might try to get rid of them by saying, hey, go sell everything, and then you'll prove to me that you view wisdom as more important than your money. Right? Because nobody wants a rich snob as a student. Right? So, so they would sometimes test people with that. And, and there was rarely a scenario where someone might actually 
embrace that idea. Most of the time, they weren't interested. But that's not what Jesus is trying to pull here. Jesus is offering him something that he's lacking. Right? Did you notice that in the, in the statement Jesus makes? Filled with love, saying one thing you lack. Jesus is saying, you're missing something, and I have the answer for you. What's he missing? It's hard for a rich guy to figure out what he's missing. Right? But what he's missing, what he's lacking, is freedom. This young man was probably a good guy. But Jesus clearly saw the obstacles in his life. He's lacking one big thing. Unrivaled allegiance to God. Because wealth is this man's God. His things are his God. Verse 22 reveals the truth. At these words... He was saddened, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. So Jesus is inviting him. He's saying, hey, I can give you what you're missing. You're missing freedom. Here's the path. The way to eternal life, worshiping God and God alone. You have an idol. Let go. When we're working really hard to own lots of stuff, what we almost always discover is that that eventually that stuff owns us. My, my dad had a funny thing he used to say. Every once in a while, my mom would try to convince him that, you know, we had, there's four kids growing up together, and she was like, we need a pool. And we had plenty of yard to put a pool in. She'd be like, wouldn't it be fun to have a pool? And he's like, I don't want a pool. And she'd be like, I, I would like a pool. He's like, I don't want a pool because that means I have to maintain a pool. And I have to use a pool enough to justify owning a pool. I don't want a thing to own me. So I don't want a pool. He also didn't want a boat. And a bunch of other stuff like that. Basically fun stuff. <laughs> uh, that was something else. But... He, was, he, he did have a point, right? That easily stuff that you think you can own begins to own you because it requires things of you, right? So how do we know that that is happening? When you get a scratch on your car and you become physically ill as a result, we've had this happen, right? Who owns who? When you get a stain on that favorite article of clothing or the strap on that favorite purse breaks and it ruins your day, what does that mean? What about when an unexpected expense or a significant loss financially sends us into a panic? What does that say about the source of our hope? If things can become hopeless... Where's our hope? What's it in? So if we jump back into our story here, you have to start to think about the question that everyone present is going to start asking themselves as a result of hearing what Jesus has said to this rich young ruler. See, they're hearing this, and everyone is thinking to themselves, at least this is what I would be thinking, is this a condition of salvation? Verse 23, and Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, how hard will it be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? How hard it will be. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Because we all have stuff. Now, 
a camel can't go through a, a sewing needle eye, right? It's, it's not possible. There, there's also commentators that talk about some kind of gate that maybe camels tried to go through that they called the eye of the needle that it was nearly impossible to get a camel through. It doesn't really matter either way how we interpret that. The bottom line is Jesus was using this as an example of impossible. Can't be done. It's, it's a ridiculous thing to think that a rich person could get into heaven. That's what he's saying. And likewise, it, it seems insane for us when we go, I need material things to exist. So, what now? Th- does this mean that salvation is truly impossible unless we're penniless? Is that what it takes? And to that question, Jesus gives us some really good news in a verse that's probably very familiar to you, but not used in this context very often. Right? Looking at them, Jesus said, With people, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. We see that on t-shirts, right? We don't think about it as, as being about getting people into heaven despite their baggage. But that's what it's about. The good news is that everything necessary for salvation for both the rich and for the poor is accomplished in Christ. He's done it. There's not an add-on that you need. A rich man can't save himself. A poor man can't save himself. However, those with possessions and wealth will have to learn not to put their trust in those temporary things. Because it'll mess you up. It's idolatry. So we should be striving for eternal treasures. And that's what Jesus is encouraging with his disciples. In verse 28 he says, Peter began to say to him, Behold, we've left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or farms for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, but that he will not receive a hundred times as much now in this present age, houses, and brothers, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. So what Jesus is saying here is if we will submit everything in our lives to Christ, when we refuse to have any idols, not things, not money, not family, not safety, not comfort, Christ is promising us that we will have what we need both now and for all eternity. Now you think about it, those disciples, they, they walked away from a lot. But as they went into any town, God gave them a place to stay. God would give them a family to live with, right? So they had even more family, right? They had the family of God in their lives. So here's the deal. It doesn't look like a winning strategy on paper. Like if you take this plan and you go, hey, um, the goal is not to get attached to stuff and you bring it into your financial planner He's going to go, the, the Jesus plan is stupid, unless he's a Christian, right? But it do, it's, it's not a good plan. I mean, from a, from a worldly standpoint, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But from an eternal standpoint, it's a really great plan. In our society, possessions matter, Right? If you have a good job, drive a nice car, live in a good house, wear name brand clothing, people notice that. They give you special attention for that. Maybe more respect. But Jesus says that obsessing over those things is a huge mistake. It's a huge blunder. It's a trap. In Luke 12, verse 15, Jesus said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. There is no point where your life consists of your possessions. 
And yet we have an, inte- an inescapable tendency to link who we are with what we have. Like they go together. And Jesus comes to rescue us from that. It's not true. No matter how much stuff you have or acquire, it will never satisfy. Because ultimately, this is true. The joy and peace you are meant to have by being fully surrendered to Christ will never be able to be replaced by stuff. No matter how great the stuff is. And Jesus loves you enough to tell you the truth. That's the truth that he's trying to give to this rich young ruler. That stuff is only going to make you a slave. Unless you let go of it. So, let's end by talking about how Christ can set us free from our material obsession and we'll expose a few lies here. So materialism lies. Number one, my stuff makes me happy. There's a reason there's a smiley face on the Amazon box. (laughs) It's spiritual warfare. (laughs) At least it's psychological warfare, right? Because if you believe this, you will always be chasing that next thing that, that promises to make you happy, that next Amazon delivery or Walmart purchase or, you know, Best Buy or whatever, wherever it is you're going is going to be the one and it lasts for a brief moment, and then there's a bill, and then there's sadness. <laughs> right? And, and, and think about how it just builds on us so quickly. You buy a new TV, and you think, man, this new TV is great. If only I had a surround sound system that was adequately matched to this TV. And then you have to get, I mean, it's a waste to have the TV without the surround sound. And then you think about how it's terrible that I'm trying to enjoy this beautiful screen and surround sound in that hideous recliner. (laughs) It only makes sense that we upgrade the furniture, right? And, And it just goes on and on. And Paul tells us something different, to be content in everything. But when we are discontent, We will find ourselves buying things that we aren't even able to use and that we can't afford. If you're buying things you can't use and can't afford, what you're actually dealing with is discontentment. Another lie that creeps in is that my stuff makes me important. And if stuff makes you important, then you have another sin occurring. It's the sin of pride. Because it says things like, look at all I have been able to accumulate. And maybe you don't say that to anybody else, but you're saying it up here. right? Look at all I've been able to do. Look at all I've worked for. Look what I've earned. And materialism and pride will almost always go hand in hand. And the next thing you know, you're telling yourself that you deserve the best. And then the thing you buy yourself becomes an offering that you willingly give to you as an act of self-worship. That's not a great scenario. And we don't like to say it like that, but isn't that what's happening? Another lie is that my stuff makes me secure. And there's a truth here that prosperity actually tempts us to become lazy in our pursuit of God, right? We have plenty, and so I don't need to depend on him. And, And it was actually a Romanian Christian that had lived in persecution and had come to America and lived in prosperity that said this. Listen to this quote. In my experience, 95% of believers who face the test of persecution pass it. while 95% who face the test of prosperity fail it. Which is more dangerous? It might be more dangerous to live in prosperity than in persecution. It sounds like it is to him. That's what he's saying. And the crazy thing is is that 
You know, we will work so hard to amass things. It might take a lifetime to build up what we end up with, and yet it can be destroyed and lost in a moment. And none of it's going with us, right? I mean, King Tut tried, and still we just dug it up and sent it around on a museum exhibit. None of it went with him. Not even the cats. <laughs> Nothing. And, and anything we do amass can be lost so quickly. I mean, literally, we could wake up tomorrow and the dollar be worth nothing. That could happen. To put our hope in that is so foolish. Our stuff doesn't actually make us secure. Where does our security come from? It's our hope in heaven. It's the fact that we have a Savior who loves us who's more than able to meet our needs. That's where our security comes from, not our stuff. Another lie is that my stuff makes me rich. Now, you're going to have people that will go, that, that is kind of the definition of rich, is a lot of stuff and money. But think about this. Can you imagine living your whole life, quote-unquote, rich, only to die and discover that you were in utter poverty? Because that's, the story that Jesus tells about the rich farmer who had, had so much abundance that he decided, I, I just need to store up more. And he made bigger barns and he filled them to the top with grain. And at the moment the project was done, he died. And he shows up on the other side and realized he was measuring his wealth incorrectly. He was measuring his wealth by what was in his barns. And his true poverty was what was in his heart. So we can find ourselves clamoring for the wrong things. Here's what can happen is materialism and coveting chains my heart to things that are temporary. When you start to think about it that way, it gets a little, a little clearer, Right? Do I really want to be chained up to stuff that isn't going anywhere? To stuff that's temporary? Is that what I want to be hitched to? Or handcuffed to? On the contrary, we, we want to actually fight back against the problem. And we can do that if we're guarding our heart. So here, here are some ways that we can guard our heart from materialism. Um, <clears throat> the first way we can guard our heart is by understanding true riches. If you measure wealth by stuff, you will always find people who are wealthier than you and who will make you feel poor, right? Everybody can find someone that they feel poor around, even the richest of the rich, right? But if you measure your riches by what Christ has done for you, then we are abundantly blessed. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich spiritually, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you, through His poverty, might become rich. He traded in the riches of heaven for the poverty of this earth so that he could give us the riches of heaven. That's true riches. If we can hang on to that, it changes how we function here. Another thing we need to do to guard ourselves is to choose gratitude. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16-18, we're instructed to rejoice always, to give thanks in all circumstances you're going to find that gratitude and greed do not coexist well. The more you practice gratitude, the less you're going to deal with greed. And even when things are going wrong, just horribly wrong, you can still find things to be thankful for if you're willing to really look around. Right? You might be running 10 minutes late to somewhere, but you could give thanks that you have a car. Right? You could give thanks that you're only 10 minutes late. <laughs> I mean, if you get creative, you can find a lot of things to give thanks for. And, and, and so, like, practice. Choose gratitude and practice it. And you'll find that 
It changes everything. Another option is dematerializing. It's, it's funny, this is actually a trend in our society now, right? Minimalist living, tiny houses. I think it's actually a response to hoarding, right? We've seen people hoard and we've gone, I don't want that. And so maybe we overreact a little bit. But it, it can actually help us get free from material obsession if we will ask ourselves, do I really need this? And will I really use it? And if I won't, then I need to really get rid of it. And I'm guilty. I mean, I pull spark plugs out of an engine and I go, you know what? These were still working. <laughs> They're old, but they work. What happens if one of my other spark plugs in the car now breaks? I could put an old one back in. Well, I'll throw it in the cabinet. I don't know which car those spark plugs go back into. I have not marked them and kept them organized. I need to throw them away, right? And, and the reality is all of us can get guilty of those kinds of things. I mean, I've hung on to things from when I was a kid that I'm never going to do anything with it. I just have it in a box, right? <coughs> Why? It never hurts to have a backup. That's what I always say. Except that it does hurt because you have piles of stuff everywhere. And the truth is that it needs to go. There's definitely decluttering that needs to happen in probably all of our lives. <coughs> With God's grace, we can learn to let go. This will also allow us to begin to give generously. And that's another great way we can fight materialism. There's nothing that will help you kill that addiction to stuff faster than giving stuff away. And I'm not talking about like a bucket of old spark plugs. Like that doesn't bless anyone, right? So this is not a good way to get rid of the stuff that no one should have. This is a good way to help someone when they actually have a need, right? So when you see a need, uh, you know, what can you do to help fill that need? Not, not, how can I unload my junk on some poor sap? Uh, that's, not a good, that's not a good blessing. Second Peter 2.14 uh, talks about how our hearts can end up being trained in greed. Like our world is training us to be greedy. And likewise, you need to be trained in generosity. So let me ask you a challenging question. When was the last time that God was so big in your life that you let go of a treasured possession in order to bless another person. When was the last time God was so big in your life that you let go of a treasured possession to bless another person? That's a challenging thought. But if we're going to go all in with Jesus, then we have to tackle this materialism monster. It needs to be held in check. So I want to encourage you or challenge you to do a little processing this week. I'm going to back my slides up here. So on these lies, is there a particular lie that you would go, mm, I probably need to do a little thinking and praying about that. I want to invite you to write that one down. Maybe you wrote them all down. Circle one. If you didn't write any down, write one down. And, and maybe do a little processing with that. Is there, is there something here that is messing me up? And then as, as well, in the, in the other side of things, these things that can guard us against materialism, is there one here where God is calling me to take a step? Right? Is there, is there one thing that the Holy Spirit might be highlighting for me here that I need to try to loosen my grip on the material things that can, can really bog us down. My prayer would be that God will do the impossible in us and guide us to a place of freedom from the bondage to stuff. Right? We think stuff is a blessing. Jesus speaks differently. It can really mess us over. It can become an idol. It can become very dangerous to our walk with the Lord because we're putting our trust in something other than Him. So let's be careful. Let's be diligent. Let's be on guard. And let's let God reshape us.
He can do it. He's able. With God, all things are possible, right? Hey, why don't you stand on your feet and let me pray for you as we leave today. God, we thank you that you are so able to do what we struggle to do. And Lord, even to be able to highlight these things in us, to, to give us this, you know, a moment of revelation and clarity, where I go, ooh, maybe the, the thing I've been collecting, maybe that's not such a good thing for me. And you begin to change our heart and help us to open our hands to you not to cling to those things, but to cling on to you. Lord, may our arms be so full of you that we can't grab on to anything else. Pray that we would see that you are enough and that we would use the things that you give to us as a blessing, as a tool, and that we would be a, a channel of those things to others as well that we would not cling tightly to stuff, but we would be willing to let it go and let it be a gift both to us and to others. And we would not love that gift, but we would love the giver. And we would put our trust and direct our love to you. You're our provider. You're our hope. You're our joy. And it's in you we're going to find true, lasting happiness. So God, help us to change the way we look at things, help us to change the way we think, and help us to act accordingly. And we trust it all to you. We pray it in Jesus' name.